Hi everyone, my name is James Stevenson. For those of you that don't know me, I'll give you a brief outline of who I am and what I do. I was a student at the University of South Wales, I studied computer security. Uh, I was also an intern at Logic, a cloud security company. I was in their SOC for around about a year, and now I'm a graduate in BT security. I've also run several websites, jamesstevenson.me, hackinginside.com, and I'm also on Twitter at underscore James Stevenson. So what are we actually going to be talking about today? Well, this is a quote by IBM, and it's a bit buzzwordy, but it's talking about preemptive security. It's talking about the idea of staying ahead of the threat, doing something now, spending some money now, to help protect ourselves in the future. Today, we're going to be talking about offender profiling, which is a type of preemptive security. Offender profiling is the idea of creating a knowledge base on a malicious actor, on an attacker. I want to break today up into three sections. I want to talk about what actually is offender profiling, I want to talk about what already exists, what organisations, what security professionals are currently doing in the field, and then I want to talk about actual tangible methods we can use for offender profiling. To start with then, what actually is offender profiling? I keep talking about it, but what actually is it? There's an example I like giving for offender profiling, and I'll be honest, I like giving it because it's simple. It's easy to get our heads around. It's the idea of a DOS attack. Let's say we have a customer and we're protecting their network. Let's say uh, they're continually getting attacked by a Scandinavian hacker group between the hours of 6 and 8. Using offender profiling, using preemptive security and general security analysis techniques, we can deduce this and then we can then tell our customer, OK, put extra load balances in place at those times. And for the rest of the day, have what you usually have. So here we've used offender profiling, we've used preemptive security, to help protect our customers. So that's what offender profiling is, but why is it important? Why do we need it? So this is a quote from the Los Angeles police chief. It's actually to do with predictive policing, but I think it describes offender profiling quite well. It's the idea that we're not getting more staff, we're not getting more money, we're not getting more time. We have to use what we have now, effectively. And that's the same in security. Security doesn't have the endless budgets it once did, it's no longer the buzzword it once was. We have to utilize everything. For example, we can see this in security, right? So if we do something now in security, if we put some security concerns or precautions in place now, we put some budgets in now, we do some research now, hopefully we'll help protect ourselves or our customers from massive data breaches in the future. So that's kind of why offender profiling is important. Doing the small things now to hopefully protect from the massive things in the future. So that's why offender profiling is important, but why is security important? Why do we need security? We wouldn't be here today if we didn't believe security was important. So this is a statistic from Having Been Pwned. And if you don't know Having Been Pwned, it's kind of a massive online database slash website of breached or compromised accounts. Now this number is really interesting. It's really interesting for two reasons. Not only is it interesting because that's a really big number, but it's interesting because it shows us security isn't going anywhere. Security is in it for the long haul. Because as long as we have things, we have things that can be broken. As long as we have things that can be broken, we have things that need protecting. So that's why offender profiling is important. That's why security is important. But why, or more specifically, what already exists? What are some examples of offender profiling in the real world? This is a white paper by Mandiant. It's probably the first white paper I ever read. Sue APT1 a Chinese hacker group that target Western organizations, believed to be state-sponsored. This white paper goes into the attacker group. It goes into their motives, their attack patterns. It goes into building a profile and building a bigger picture on APT1. It's definitely worth a read. We have another white paper here, this one by F-Secure. This white paper goes into the Callisto group. Again, building a bigger picture on the malicious actors, going into attack patterns, going into motives, and things along those lines. Finally, we have a white paper by McAfee. This is McAfee's annual threat report. This white paper goes into a wide range of attack factors, a wide range of malicious actors, and again builds that bigger picture. We might start seeing a pattern here. It's all about that bigger picture. So those are some examples of event profiling, at a very high level at least. I mean, you could sit down and read these white papers, and I definitely recommend you do. But at a very high level, that's some examples of offender profiling in the real world. Those are some real organizations that utilize offender profiling to build knowledge bases 
on malicious actors, on attackers. But where is offender profiling used? There's a whole range of places where offender profiling could be used. This is just one example. So as I said earlier, I worked in a company called Alert Logic, and they deal a lot of SOC work, so they do a lot of security operations. Now this diagram here, at a very high level, is how a SOC normally works. We have two elements. We have our customer, and we have our SOC, our security operation center. Our customer will have an IDS, an intrusion detection system, a WAF, a partition firewall, or some sort of logging system, and they'll then send logs to our SOC, to our security operation center. And our SOC will have an analyst, the analyst will review those logs and say, what's actually happening here? Is this a false positive? Is this a false negative? And then we'll send that feedback back to the customer. And that's really good, because we get this kind of feedback loop. We get logs, analysis, feedback. And it works really well. The problem with it, though, is normally it looks at one attack at a time. There might be multiple incidents or multiple events, but generally it's one attack. So we take one attack, analyze it, feedback. And the problem with that is we're not looking at multiple attacks. We're not looking at the bigger picture, which is what we said was so important with offender profile. It's all about understanding that bigger picture. So could, could we use this method of a security operation center, but start building a bigger picture, start looking at the bigger picture of a malicious actor? Well, yes, yes we could. So this is, is an example of a framework. We kind of latch on a framework to this already existing customer SOC model. We say, well, we get our logs from our customer and we analyze them as normal. But while that's happening, we take um, that information and we bucket it. We say this attack is related to this attack, this attack related to this attack, this attack related to one you had last week. And now we bucketed that information. So later down the road, we can then give that to our customer and say this attack you just had, it's related to one you've previously had, or it's related to one another one of our customers has had. Building that bigger picture for the customer or ourselves and allowing us to understand more about the person who's attacking us, why, the motive, and things along those lines. So that's where offender profiling could be used. We've spoken about what it is, people who use it, and where it can be used. So let's dive in, right? It's time to actually look at offender profiling. Well, not quite. There's something I like to refer to as method zero for offender profiling. And it's the idea of understanding what we're protecting. Because we can't protect it if we don't know what it is. So the method zero of offender profiling, the first thing we need to do before we do offender profiling, is to look at our assets, to say, what are we actually protecting? Earlier I said I own a website, jamesstevenson.me. That's an asset, that's something I'm protecting. Okay, well, what about its name? Well, that's its name. Classification, is it high risk, is it low risk? A description, well, it's a WordPress website. Then its owner, its custodian, that's myself. And then its user, that's the public, that's you and I. And understanding our assets using an information classification like this, allows us later down the road to profile malicious actors more effectively. Because if we have two attacks, one of them attacking a low-risk asset, and one of them attacking a high-risk asset, if this is the only information we have, we can safely assume that the attack against the high-risk asset is more important or more significant than the attack against the low-risk asset. So that's why we do this information classification. That's why we do this asset profiling for offender profiling. So, Jumping in then, our first method for offender profiling. This is probably one of my favorite names for uh, these methods because it actually describes what it does. Some, we'll see some methods like down the road that actually don't quite make sense in their names. But this one, it's called attack significant plotting, or attack significance plotting, I should say. The way this method works is it's really simple. We take a time frame, so here we have a time frame between four and five. And then whenever we see an attack in that time frame, we plot it on our graph, we increment it. So we say, okay, we have an attack here, we have an attack here, and then we get these peaks. And if we don't see an attack in a time frame, we decrease the significance. There's some maths behind all this works, but generally it increases and it decreases. So we end up getting these peaks and these troughs. And that's really good, because that then allows us to compare malicious actors. It allows us to look at the significance, look at the frequency of these attacks, and to say which of them is more significant, which of them is more frequent. So here we can see two different malicious actors. We can see a malicious actor from Russia and a malicious actor from China. We'll go into these naming conventions later on, but generally that's all you need to know for now. So we can see these two malicious actors. We can see one of them has a continued significance, has a continued frequency. 
Through that time frame, they are continuing to attack. While for this Russian militia sector, you can see that they attack, they stop attacking, they attack again, they stop attacking. So we have these peaks and these troughs. So here, we can try and the information, we can start comparing the tactics and say which of these is more important, which of these do we need to deal with right here and now, and which one can we deal with next. So that's why this information is so important. This, why this method for offender profiling is quite useful, because it allows us to say which of these do we need to deal with now. So that's one method for offender profiling. Let's look at another method for offender profiling. This method is called attack factor comparison analysis, and this is one of those names I'm not a fan of because it doesn't actually describe what it is. This method specifically looks at the risk of an attack. It says, what is the risk of this attack to myself right now as this attack is happening? And the way we work this out is we look at our impact and our likelihood. So right here we have our likelihood, and we have to ask ourselves several questions. Questions like, what's the complexity of the attack? What's the ease of discovery, ease of exploit, and what's the motive behind the attack? And when we answer these questions, with a number between 0 and 10. So these numbers between 0 and 10 can be said as qualitatively or as quantitatively as you want. For example, you could say a 0 is uh, an SQL injection attack, like a really simple SQL injection attack, and a 10 is a 0 day. Or you could just let it float, you could put it quantitatively, right? you could tell the analyst, answer it as you want. So taking these numbers allows us to look at the likelihood of the attack. Let's say, how likely was this attack to have occurred? And for our next one, we look at the impact. We say, what's the impact of this attack? And again, we rate these questions between 0 and 10. So here we have ease of, um, sorry, loss of confidentiality, loss of integrity, loss of availability, uh, financial damage, reputational damage. And answering these questions between 0 and 10, let us look at the impact of the attack. What was the impact of this attack to us? Now you might be thinking, these numbers are really low. That's because this attack was sampled from a honeypot, which was designed to be compromised, so the impact was actually quite low. So that's why we have really low numbers here. So moving on then, the actual point of this method is to look at risk. And the way we look at risk is we take our average from our likelihood, we take our average from our impact, and then we times them together. And here we get a number between 0 and 100. Obviously, a higher number, a risk of 100, let's say, is more of a risk than a risk of a lower number, let's say a risk of 1. So here we have a risk of 3.5. This risk is really low. Now, as again, that's because it's against a honeypot. But if this was an attack against your organization, you could say, okay, well, we have an attack of 3.5, and we have attack, an attack of risk 60. Which of those would you deal with first? You'd probably deal with a risk of 60. You could probably accept the risk of 3.5. So that's why we have that, this method. So we can compare attacks, we can compare the risk of attacks, and we can say which of these do we need to deal with right here and now. So, moving on to our third method. Here, I really didn't want to talk about the cyber kill chain. I really didn't want to talk be about the cyber kill chain, because some people love it and some people hate it. But if you don't know, the cyber kill chain is a method by Lockheed Martin that was designed to analyze the life cycle of malware exploitation. And it's really good, it's a really good model. Some people don't like it, however, because quite frankly it's overused. It was designed for specifically malware exploitation, but it's used across the field in computer security. So here we have a far more generic kill chain model designed for computer security. We have five sections. We have our researching the target, testing infrastructure, actively attacking our actions, and our actions are great, you've exploited the machine, but why are you actually here? What are you doing? Is this um, hacktivism? Is this malicious? What are you doing? And then we have our covering tracks and planting backdoors. And these are kind of our stages of an attack that we think a malicious actor can go into. And you're probably thinking, well James, that's great and all, but what's the point of this, right? What's the point of this method? Well, the reason we have this method is that we take one of these attacks and we pin it to the profile of our malicious actor. Which part of an attack is the malicious actor in? Which part of this attack relates to one of these sections in the life cycle? And that then allows us to start comparing attacks, allows us to start triaging, which many of these models have already done. So we can say, well, we have two attacks. One of them is in the reconnaissance stage, and one of them is in the action stage. Which of these should we deal with first? It'd be the actions one, right? We'd have to deal with the actions first, because they're already in our system. 
while the reconnaissance isn't, is not that. So that's why we have a model like this. So the next model we have is to do with asking questions. It's the idea of quite simply and quite frankly asking simple questions about our target or about our malicious actor. So here we ask questions like, who is the target of the attack? For example, will they an individual, a group, a government organization? We ask questions like, why were they the target? Was it part of a massive reconnaissance attack? or were they an individual target? We then have to ask questions about our attacker, if we know them. Questions like, again, were they a group, a government organization, an individual? Questions like, what was their motive? Was it hacktivism? Was it malicious? Was it financial gain, or were they state-sponsored? We have to ask questions like this, as well as questions like, did anything happen in the run-up to this attack? Were there any threats? Was there anything in the news? Anything in social media? Because it's all of these questions. These questions paired with knowing information about the attacker, knowing information about the malicious actor, that allow us to answer this final question. And this is the question of knowing what we know now, knowing what we know of the malicious actor, knowing what we know of the target. Is this attack likely to continue? Because one out of three things are likely. Either the attack failed out, right? The attack failed, but they're going to try again, or the attack succeeded. And two out of three of these are really bad. So we want to make sure that we know where the malicious actor is, what the malicious actor is currently doing, so that we can deal with that. Because building a profile of a malicious actor is great, but knowing how that affects us is even more important. So we have a final method here, this being method seven. Now, this isn't really a method, this is more kind of method 0.5. Instead of profiling, this method looks at categorizing. And we say, great, we have this profile, we have this knowledge base of a malicious actor, but how do we identify this malicious actor? Well, there are several ways we could do this, right? We could take an IP address, we could take a hash, we could take a MAC address. This is just one example of how we could take a unique identifier, or a sub-unique identifier, for a malicious actor, and instantly be able to gauge information off that naming convention. So here we have four sections of a name. We have RU Jan 411. This means the malicious actor was first seen originating from Russia on, in January, has a risk level of 4, and the last octet of their first seen IP address is 11. So here we can see that we have these kind of unique, or I keep saying unique, but really I mean sub-unique identifiers for malicious actors. So we've seen these throughout, we've seen some from China, some from Russia, some from the United States, and they allow us to sub-uniquely identify malicious actors. So that's it. That's all of the methods we're going to be talking about today about offender profiling. I do want to leave you this quote to other. This quote I'm quite a fan of. It's the idea that intrusion analysis, that security analysis, is far more than TCP dump. It's far more than Wireshark. It's far more than looking at information on the line. It's about understanding the bigger picture, which is what we keep talking about. It's about understanding that an attack, or behind every attack, there is a person. And I think that's why we use offender profiling, to understand, great, we understand our attack, but who's behind the attack? What's the motive? What are the patterns of the attack? So there we have it. That's been my talk on offender profiling. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me now. You can find me afterwards. Or as I said, I also run a website, jamesegans.me, and I'm also on Twitter at underscore James Stevenson. You can go find me there as well. Thank you.